Is this computer connected? Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the second night of the series we began yesterday at a church yesterday. We want to thank you. There's been a bit of a technical issue and we delayed, but that's okay. We are happy to come to you from this location here with God's message. I want to ask you, please, to close your eyes with me before we start and study your word, uh, study God's word today. Let's close our eyes and we pray. Almighty God in heaven, we thank you so much for the wonderful evening you have given to us. We are so privileged and so blessed and so lucky that we, those of us who have been defeated and crushed and have been labeled as enemies of, of the throne room of your majestic power, have now through the grace and your mercy have been able to con become connected with you. Lord, we pray that you bless us as we begin this evening meeting, and may our hearts be uplifted. This is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. See, this week, we are talking about the idea of staying afloat. We are living in a very difficult and challenging time. The times that we are living in are so unpredictable that anything can happen anytime. Like, for instance, the COVID-19. No one knew COVID would change the landscape of the social life, political life, and the emotions and feelings of people all over. And I wonder what else will be the next event that will change and transform and redefine, if you like, the life of many people right around the world today. So when we talk about the idea of floating in difficult times, it is not becoming an alarmist. It is not trying to paint a gleam picture of the future to unsettle you so that you will be disturbed from your peace and the normalcy of life. No, the reality of life is that crisis will and thus eat us individually, us as families, or in global scale in the world. And therefore, we as individuals were thinking and wise must always be prepared for those things. So tonight's title is simply preparing a survival kit. Imagine sitting in an aircraft and you see a beautiful lady whom we identify as an hostess coming through the hallways of the aircraft saying the familiar tone. Ladies and gentlemen, she says, before we take off, just in the unlikely event of an emergency, I want you to pay attention as I go through the procedures, the emergency procedures, she says. There are two doors up here in the front, and there are two doors at the back, and there's another door in the middle. And then she goes on to explain how every individual must try to reenact the process of survival in an emergency. So emergency is not a religious idea. Trying to survive in emergency or crisis times is not a religious idea. It is the everyday occurrence. In fact, society today is such that the idea of emergency, the idea of preparing for crisis has become a massive multi-billion dollar industry. Did you know that? There are, there are bomb bunkers have been built because people are frightened the third world may take place. And there are other ways of people going about to prepare themselves just in case um, crisis might take place. Some time ago, there was a documentary in the Discovery Channel about a group of idea, idealists or philosophers, I guess. Some scientists also were included. They were questioning the idea, what if there's, a, there's, a, there's, an, um, there's an unidentified object from outer space like a meteorite hit the planet and dislodge the planet and the planet disappears. Or they talked about the, the neuron, neutron bomb. If the neutron star, sorry, not bomb, neutron star, if somehow the neutron star would hit the solar system, they sort of get the, the impression that the whole solar system will collapse because of the very high intensity of gravitational pull that exists in a neuron 
um, neuron star. So it was really frightening. But the interesting thing that I saw was that the idea that, that they could create a, a sort of a spacecraft, a spacecraft propelled by engine, but this massive spacecraft, they could create it with plants and river systems and with the climate conditions just as they have. The difference, though, is that it's propelled by engines, and it will propel right into space. And if the Earth could be displaced or destroyed, this spacecraft can carry it just a representative of the human race, and they can float into space. And somewhere out there, there is some kind of a planet they can land and repopulate again. It was a very fanciful scientific uh, science fiction story they told, and it was amazing. Today, I want to tell you this. You know. As we go through the concept of survival and crisis times, we must always remember that there has been a book in the history. We call the book, called the Bible. This Bible has an emergency plan. That is an emergency plan that has always been recorded, has been recorded there to help us prepare for the emergency. See, survival instinct is in all of us. When you jump into the sea and if you start swimming, there's, while enjoying the, uh, while enjoying swimming, you always become aware that I need to survive just in case something happens. So survival instinct is part of life. If you throw a rock at a snake or a bed, they'll quickly respond and run away. Why? Because survival instinct is built right into their psychic, in the, in, in the individual, in, in the makeup. If someone does something like this to you, you quickly turn your eyes or close your eyes. It's because of the survival instinct in you. Survival instinct is really natural. It's part of us. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis and chap chapter 13, has this very interesting story, which I sort of uh, related uh, on Saturday or Sabbath morning when I talked. You see, in the book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13, the Bible says, says God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So hang on, my friends. There was a time in the history when the whole world was destroyed, came under flood. That's according to the scriptures. But if you look at the extra biblical literatures and writings, even in, in, the, in the real scientific world, they do believe that there was a time many years ago, millions according to the scientists, that there was this powerful, powerful meteorite that came and eat the earth, and nearly one third of the living creatures in this world were destroyed. And among them were the dinosaurs. That's what I say. But in the Bible, we have the story of a time when a worldwide flood did take place. It's recorded in the whole Hebrew book we call the Bible. And so the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1 onwards, the Bible says, iniquity of men was great. And God said, it is not. I must destroy this world. And the advice he gives in chapter 6 and verse 14 is simply this. God giving this advice to Noah. The Bible says, Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. So this is God's idea of survival that he gave to Noah. God knew that a crisis was going to be destructive. The crisis was going to end every conceivable life on the surface of the earth. So the only exceed route, the only survival is that Noah was called to build this house. You know, I want to tell you this. When the ark was built, this is according to the scriptures. Did you know that the earth did not see the hard pouring of rain. They had no idea about the rain up to that point in time because the Bible says that before that, there was no rain because the earth was in perfect condition. And when God told them that there was going to be a flood, rain coming down or water coming down out of the heavens and destroy this world, people doubted it because the Bible also says that when the point 
came for the world to be destroyed by flood. The Bible tells us that the condition that allowed God to destroy this planet was because of the wickedness. How were they wicked? How did the wickedness come into being? If you look at the Bible in Genesis 6, 4, the Bible says, Naphtalim were on the earth. In those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men and they bore children to them, these were mighty men who were old, men of old, men of renown, the Bible says. So if you look at these ideas and try to compare with uh, commentators and scholars, one of the things that you'll find is, I've summarized it for you just in four, four compartments there. It is the result of this intermarriage between God's people and the people of this world is that the result is that the children that were born, the Bible says, they were giants. It's not physically giant, but they were, they were giant thinkers and inventors. The second thing is that these men and women who lived at advanced military skills with weapons of mass destruction. The word men of renown means they were men of highly cultivated military skills with weapons proportionate to the skills they had. So they were not just thinkers and scientists and philosophers and inventors, but they were also skilled in battling out and fighting and destroying the enemy and at the weapons necessary to destroy each other. And they were extremely confident because on one end they had the knowledge and on another hand they had the power to destroy. So combination of the knowledge and the power to destroy gave them the confidence to an extent that they had no regard or no fear for God. Church was the condition that prevailed during the days of Noah. And so when Noah told them that there was going to be a flood or water coming out of the heavens that they did not know or they had no scientific explanation to, as to how that, was, that could ever be possible, they started doubting and never listened to Noah's preaching. If you look at the Bible, the Bible clearly tells us that Noah preached for 120 years. That's a long time. Noah preached for 120 years. But for those 120 years, he realized that humanity has made up their mind never to have some degree of respect or regard for the God of heaven. So for 120 years, it was not colorfully decorating speeches and entertaining them by his, his rhetoric and all his fasci you know, fascination and imaginative talks and ideas he was giving to them. 120 years was just one simple message. Repent. God is going to change flood. If you don't repent, God is sending the flood. And if you don't want to be destroyed, I have built a hack here enough to carry enough men and women and invited them to the boat. But the story is simple. It's interesting. They never came to the boat. So the point is simply this, ladies and gentlemen and brothers and sisters. God gave the wisdom to a very humble man to come up with the idea to save humanity. But they thought that was a very simple, hopefully simplified idea, and they didn't like it. You see, the thing is that when on one end you have the giant thinkers, the inventors, people with military skills, and highly cultivated beings, and they are giants physically and mentally on one side. On the other side was, was someone called Noah, very humble. And the Bible says Noah was a righteous man. The description Bible gives to Noah is he was righteous. And then the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So in other words, Noah was humble and gracious and he had a very deep, intimate connection with God. Whereas on the other hand, there is this mess of people who had confidence in themselves look at their own skills, look at their own knowledge, and they thought God's idea is ridiculous and didn't make sense. When the representative of God was telling them that there is going to be a flood, they ridiculed him, they undermined his influence, and they did not even want to listen to Noah's preaching. 
and they were saying, there has never been a time in the history of humanity that rain came down from the skies. It is impossible, scientifically impossible. It has never happened, and it will not happen, and do not tell us about it. But you know what, Noah? Noah did not submit to those presses. He kept repeating the message. There is a flood coming, flood coming, flood coming. Repent, flood coming, flood coming, repent. For 120 years, and none of them repented. Only his wife, his three sons, their three wives, they were the only ones, one single family unit got saved, and they went into the board and delivered. It seems to me, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we have replicated. The society today is almost as though Noah's time all over again. See, today you have giant thinkers, people who could use these powerful binoculars and, and scan the universe, and they say, well, I can see galaxies, stars, and the co cosmology out there, the universe out there, but I can't see God's throne. There is no God up here. There is no God down there. There is, not, there is no God in the cellular, cellular wall and, and right in the atoms. We can't see God. Therefore, Christianity's message about a God will exist and there's a burning hell fire coming is a fabricated story just to make the scary ones even become more scarier. And I want to tell you this. Just like Noah, the Christian truth has been ridiculed. But you know what? When the reality strikes, when a flood came, hundreds and millions of healthy, thinking, powerful people were destroyed not by the mass, um, weapons of mass destruction they created, but destroyed by God's power and God's might. And you know, today I want to tell you this. Today, the Bible says that it is not the flood coming from the heavens. You know what? The Bible in, says in the book of Revelation, it is fire coming down from the heavens. It is fire. Bowls of fire will roll down through the, through the skies and burn up everything in this world. Have we seen fire coming down from the skies? No. We have never seen it. And we may question it and cast some doubts to it. But brothers and sisters, I believe in the whole Hebrew Bible for a number of reasons, and I'm going to go through them with you just now. You see, there is God's voice and there is man's voice. The man's voice says God doesn't matter. God's voice says my voice matters. Why is it that God's voice matters and man's voice we should not pay attention? Because man's voice is our voice. I am a man, you are a man. So someone who claims to be the president, the king, the prime minister, the leader, the scientist, the philosopher, is just like you with bones and eyes and noses and feelings. He's just like you, limited. He's only talking because he has got the opportunity to talk. He's talking because he has the brain to conceptualize the material world and do a bit of observation. And in his observation, he sees and finds God, the spiritual being, is not there. And therefore, he says, God doesn't exist. So it is irrelevant, he says. But he's just a limited human being. Human being like me probably would live up to 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. He gets his fortnight salary, buys bread and butter every day, and eats his breakfast and lunch and evening meal, and goes to bed just like you. They are not gods. But for some reason, these guys, these guys supposedly have become gods and goddesses in the thinking of many people. We'd rather listen to them than the voice of God that comes from the throne room of heaven. So today we live in a world where these two voices are competing for our attention. The voice of God from heaven and the voice of man from this world. Take a peek, my brothers and sisters. You want to listen to human voice or listen to God's voice? I'd rather listen to God's voice God's voice because of his integrity, because of how the voice of God has been passed down throughout the ages and the predictions that he had made had come to fulfill very, very, to the very late letter. Now, in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 25, we have this fascinating verse. The Bible says, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape, escape, when they refused him 
who won them on the earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who wants from heaven. See, the book of Revelation, the uh, book of Hebrews, tells us that we must be careful not to refuse him who speaks from heaven. Because why? Because the Bible says many refuse the voice that came from heaven and they paid the price and they lost their life. The very good example is the people of Noah. God spoke and they didn't listen. God warned and they didn't pay attention. And what was the result? Every single one of them was swept away in the mighty flood like dead rats, like dead dogs, like dead cats, like animals with no dignity whatsoever. They were stripped away and carried into the destruction and they died. And the warning that comes to us from the book of Hebrews is simply this. The voice that comes from heaven is a voice we need to pay close attention or else we might pay the price just like them. So in John chapter 20, verse 30, Jesus made this profound statement. The interesting thing is this, is that this, before I make this statement, let's read this verse. John chapter 20 and verse 30, the Bible says, the purpose of this book, that is the book that John was writing, which includes the Bible, says the purpose of this book, he says, now this book, now Jesus did many signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So what the Bible is telling us is that there are so many things Jesus did that are not written in this book. Because if they were written, the book would be so big that no one in the world would be able to lift it up and carry it around. That's John's writing about this. He says, but these are written in chapter 20 and verse 31, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I want you to slow down and think about this. What Jesus is saying is this. What Jesus is saying is this. What he is saying is that this book, the Christian Bible, is here with us. Many people can read this book as the history book. That means that you are looking for facts of history in this book. Now, if you look for historical facts in this book, you won't find a lot. There is few historical th things, but there's a lot of others not written there, okay? So to an historian, well, that's not much information over here, okay? Everything over here is suspect, they may say. Or if you're a philosopher reading this book, you may read and say, well, there's not much thinking associated with some of this book. You know, well, there are lots of books written by Hindu philosophers, Chinese philosophers, and there are other philosophers. So there isn't much here. Scientists, mm, practically nothing here. So what I'm saying here is that if you read this book and class it as just a classical book of antiquity, then what you end up is just a book with no hope, only a story that talks about something that happened which is not relevant today. But in John's assessment, this is what he's saying. He's saying all those documents that historians will be looking for are not written. All those things that philosophers are looking for are not written here. All those things that the scientists are looking for are not here. Why? A scientist, a philosopher, a historian would be reading to satisfy their curiosity, that's all. Nothing more, nothing less. They're just reading to satisfy their curiosity, their anchor for knowledge. So the Bible is clear. He's saying this book is not intended to satisfy meaningless curiosity. And what is the reason why it was given? The Bible tells us it was written so that you could believe. That little information here is written that you could believe in Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. That's why this is man's last survival kit. This book is man's last survival kit. If you're afraid of the COVID disease or if you're afraid um, some of the meteorites may come and eat the planet, if you're so scared that there may be an atomic war or, or war between 
US or Russia or anything like that, if you're scared of that and you're unsure, or if you're t t scared of the climatic changes that are threatening the existence of men today, if you're scared of this, well, apart from looking at a solution in humanity that has caused the problems in this world, why not come out and look at the solution God provides? And God is saying, you know what? I've given you a book so you can look at briefly and find out the summary step of what you need to do to escape and survive when a crisis would hit this place. Oh, brothers and sisters, how can we be so silly, so dumb? We haven't lived 100 years or 200 years or 500 years. We have never lived that long and we will never live that long. Our life is just a short period of time. This period of time is not to play around and allow our life to be to be captured by the imagination of other fellow human beings who are just like us. How can I give my life away and believe in the theories of, of, and ideas of another human being who was talking simply because he has read a lot of books or discovered certain things in the universe? I do not want to bank my precious life and deposit my life in the hands of these fellow human beings. I'd rather give my life to a God who says he is no human being but he possesses the realms of eternity to receive us and to deliver us from this mess. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 46 and verse 9 and 10, this is this interesting text. The question I'm asking is, who claims the ability to truly know the future? You see, this is the question. The greatest test is who knows the future. Without any other thing, mechanically, how can anyone tell the future? And Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10, has this very daring statement. Daring because God claims to know the future. And this is how it says, Remember the former things of old? I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the hand from the beginning, from the ancient things that are not yet done. So God is claiming that he alone knows the future. He alone can tell what will happen in the future, the Bible says. It's a daring statement. I mean, some people who are very brilliant can use the laws of probability to figure out what may happen in, in the stock market, for instance, or statistically uh, talk about what will happen in the trend of the economy or some sort of things like that. But this prediction that Jesus is talking about here is not based on trends. He is making predictions completely unrelated to social trends and other events of this world. He's predicting things, drastic things that are totally not related. One of them is the end of the world, okay? You know what? Because man is such a curious being, we are so curious that mystics and astrologers have been attempting to predict the future for thousands of years. You know why? have this group of witches and witchcrafts and, and what they're doing in their homes and whatever they may be doing, they've been trying to tell the future is because future really captures men's imagination. People want to know what will happen in 20 years time, 10 years time. And when you are able to predict with amazing accuracy, you are someone whom the world will hold their existence to you. So that's why this group of people try to take advantage of the human yearning to know the future and try to play up with all these, these demonic things to predict the future, to take advantage of human desire to know the future. Millions of people read their horoscope to discover, discover the future. Every newspaper on the land, there is so much things about the horoscope and people hungering and longing to know what is happening. These are satanic organizations, demonic powers at work because men is naturally suspicious of the future and want to know where he or she is headed. And they're taking advantage of it, brothers and sisters. But you know what? It happened in 2012. The Mayan calendar predicted that the world was going to end in 2012. But guess what? The world never ended. Now the story here is that all these imaginary ideas and religious ideas and philosophers and believers have tried to tell the future, but God says he is the only one who can predict the future. 
is the only one that can predict the future. With over 1,000 clear prophecies and one third of the Bible devoted to prophecies, you can take God's challenge and test if he is real and can truly predict the future. And I'm telling you, in the Bible, there are 1,000 clear prophecies. One third of them are devoted to prophecy. And you can challenge yourself and look at the prophecies and you'll find that every prophecy that God predicts fulfills on the dot without delay. King Cyrus is a very good example. Commanded the rebuilding of the Jewish temple during his reign as a result of studying the prophecies contained in the book of Daniel, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. He believed the prophetic writing so much so that even though Jewish nation was a captured nation, he feared the God who knew the future, so he gave permission, wrote the necessary laws and degrees, allowing the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. Because even though Jewish people were conquered, he believed that the power who controls time and predicts future is someone he needed to fear. So King Cyrus did that. And the other one is a man called Alexander the Great. Spared the city of Jerusalem from destruction and worship in its temple after he was shown the prophecies of the book of Daniel. King Alexander the Great, the empire, had conquered Jerusalem. But when the book of prophecies of the Daniel were revealed to him, he did not want to destroy and touch it. Why? Because of the amazing accuracy that predicted that Alexander the Great would come in history many years ago by prophet Daniel. Alexander the Great himself saw with an eye and he said, man, this is amazing. Someone knew my existence hundreds of years ago and the guy, God who knew the future is a God who res demands my respect. And so Alexander the Great respected God and allowed the city of Jerusalem to be intact. Then look at this. Jesus Christ himself told his followers they needed to study and understand the book of Daniel. His life and death were also perfectly matched to the prophecies contained in the Old Testament. So Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, he linked the Old Testament prediction in it, to his existence. And he said he is the living fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, he said. Amazing. Santa Hussein believed that he was the modern fulfillment of a key character in the prophecy, prophetic book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. So he thought that he was a direct descendant of King Nebuchadnezzar, so he proclaimed himself as the leader. See, the point I'm trying to make here, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, is that God has given us a very simplified survival kit in the form of the Bible. And we go for other books of ideas and philosophers, and we have little or no time for the book that came from heaven designed primarily to provide a survival kit for you and me, and we're ignoring the pages of the sacred writing. What does the book reveal? Why, who, sorry, who does God reveal his secrets through? God reveals his secrets through the prophets, through the apostles. They were not brilliant men. Some were brilliant, others went, some were farmers, others were judges and rulers, tax collectors, lawyers, but all of them, in spite by the living power of the Holy Spirit, came together and provided the one and only survival kit. Here I have in my hand a copy of the survival kit. I would like to encourage you to spend time reading the survival kit. And in this survival kit, you will find Jesus. And when you find Jesus, when you believe in him, he will give you the simple steps to survive in the calamities and crisis that are soon to eat this earth. Tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening, I will continue to build on it. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, let us thank God that he has given us a survival kit, one that we need to pay attention and spend time reading and thinking 
and allowing God to talk to us through his survival kit, the Holy Bible. May God bless you. Let me pray for you, and we'll end our meeting tonight. Let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity we have to spend time thinking and talking about the survival kit that you have given to us, the Holy Bible. We have it right now in abundance. If we have neglected it, if we have ignored it, Lord, give us the sense of burden and the need and the desire to go right into it and read it and find the steps necessary to survive in these crisis times. Bless us, Lord, is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I'll see you again same time tomorrow evening. God bless you.